it went through that 10 year consolidation when it broke out, it really broke out emphatically. And what we believe this is only the, the, the sort of a, a cusp of what's to come in the next three to five years. Talking Nickel here with Silver Elephant and John. And John, for me, um, Nickel, we discussed it last time, one of the hidden champions in the EV decarbonization space. How come, in addition to uh, all the other metals that you're also looking at, Nickel? Actually, Arnie, Arnie Nickel is my passion. I started, uh, I started uh, running mining companies in 2010 and Nickel caught my attention. So I'm one of the very few CEO. I've acquired Nickel projects in the Yukon, in, in Sudbury's, in Manitoba. But I was early in the game. That was before even um, um, nickel batteries and EV batteries and the, sort of the EV wave got started. So I, I can say that you know I'm probably one of the very few CEOs that know, that know the nickel space very well. And the reason I like nickel is it's, it's not as common as, as copper, but but it's not as you know crazy to find, difficult to find as as uh, gold and silver. And that's why I sort of piqued my interest in the nickel started uh, almost 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned it's a bit easier to find. Um, your uh, project is based in the Thompson Nickel Belt. So it kind of sounds like a no brainer. Um, how come that there's still projects available? Yes and no. I think that there are only three or four major nickel producing camps in Canada and Thompson Nickel Belt is the second largest nickel camp, uh, nickel producing camp in North America, just after Sudbury and, be and uh, ahead of Voices Bay. The uh, Thompson Nickel Belt specifically, majority of the land is controlled by Valley, which used to be Inco, that Valley acquired. And this project that we, we were very lucky to have, have bought two years ago was controlled by a junior company that owned the project for since early 2000. But unfortunately, the founder um, passed away and they had some debt uh, that came calling and created the opportunity for us to acquire it. Otherwise, it would not have been available. Perhaps we can also dive into that alternative demand for nickel just aside from EVs and batteries. Well, currently about 80% of the nickel goes into uh, stainless steel. So that, that touches every facet of, of your life. The utensils that you use, construction piping, and um, you know it has that anti-corrosive, is malleable, is ductile. So it's one of the very uh, utility metal per se. And, it's time. and the interesting point is because of the, even on the most conservative uh, sort of EV estimate by 2030, uh, nickel demand has, nickel production needs to double. And so I was jokingly say that the only way for that to happen, given the flat nickel production in the last two, 10 years and nickel actually which production went down last 2021 versus 2020, is that they have to find substitutes for the traditional steel industry, uh, nickel industry to produce a stainless steel. So your spoon is not going to be as shiny as it was before, but nonetheless, you know, the nickel market overall had already reached an equilibrium from the supply and demand perspective. And that's why that addition of the EV space would just was completely changed the landscape. That's why you saw the big swing, in the nickel price in 2020, uh, just this time last year in March, when nickel went from $10 to $50, because it went through that 10 year consolidation when it broke out, it really broke out emphatically. And what we believe this is only the, the, the sort of a, a cusp of what's to come in the next three to five years. Okay, and I mean, we just mentioned here the, uh, the big macro trend of EVs. Of course, there's going to be different battery technologies, but there's also going to be other uh, uses uh, such as energy storage, which is uh, might even be a bigger market at the end of the day than EVs, uh, given the amount of solar and other green energy installations that all require storage in order to balance the grid. We're talking about supply and demand. We've seen in the copper space that because prices have been so low for a decade or so, that there's been very few new projects coming on board. So the pipeline, the funnel is kind of not there. How does that compare to the nickel market right now in terms of new projects and when they are due to come on board? Right on. Nickel, nickel came from two different types of deposit. There is the, the laterite deposit and there's a sulfide deposit. Even though nickel production has been flat, majority of the growth, um, what, what, what I mean by that is that the laterite portion of the nickel supply has been increasing from 25%, roughly 25% of the overall supply 10 years ago. Now it's more than 60% of the supply. So what happens is that all the nickel, new nickel mines coming on stream are laterized. Unfortunately, the laterite has a very high carbon consumption because the, the method of, of extracting nickel out of the laterites. And which means that if, if we talk about EV specifically, the, the sulfide production has not increased at all. In fact, it's been, it's been slowing down for the last 10 years. And the picture is not, it's not getting better uh, because you know, the nickel price hasn't really gone up in the last 10 years, sitting at $10 a pound right now. 
just one note only for another sort of anecdotal evidence in the nickel sulfide space, not the latter, right, is that because of there's no new mines going into production, average grade of a nickel sulfide deposit has gone from 0.8% nickel uh, 10 years ago to now 0.4%. And the estimate says by 2029, that grade will go from 0.4% to 0.2%. And also given the current environmental sort of constraints and, and the logistical lockdown and the whole debacle of, of, of health mandates it, and billions of dollars inflation to get nickels out of the ground, um, it, it's just not, there's not going to be a lot of increase in the nickel on, on the horizon production. So just to translate that for those who are not mining experts, what John is trying to tell us here is that overall production is flat, but the carbon intensive production, the production with a very high impact on the environment, that's uh, the production that has been increasing. So with the ESG topic, uh, with more environmental conscious along the supply chain end to end, we are going to see demand for the cleaner nickel. So. Uh, increase over time.